This is the Benefits Buzz Podcast, your weekly pulse on what's happening in the world of employee benefits. Brought to you by your friends at WEX, who believe in simplifying benefits for everyone. Now listen up, and let's get buzzed! Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Benefits Buzz. Cobra, ARPA, 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 Cobra, holy smokes, we are in overload here. We got a great episode for you. My name is Eric Piella co-host of the Benefits Buzz podcast. I'm joined as always by Kelsey Berger. Kelsey, we got some ARPA stuff to cut over here. Yikes. We do. We do. You know, we always joke around at WEX about the number of acrony- acronyms that we have to memorize, HR people have to memorize, consultants have to memorize, administrators. And today is going to be no joke because <laughs> we are going to be digging deep into those acronyms. We, we are, absolutely. And we know. So one of the things that we've gleaned through all this legislation and all this uh, ARPA plan that is that there's been tons of questions. Like, we've been getting tons of questions. You have tons of questions. And so we decided to dedicate an episode just to answering questions around uh, COBRA ARPA compliance. And to do so, we have a, a, a fantastic guest who is totally ready to rock and roll and answer your toughest questions that we've gathered mm-hmm. here. His name is Bob Radicky. He's Senior Regulatory and Public Policy Analyst at Benefit Comply. Bob, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Eric. Thanks for having me. And yes, I'm just excited about answering COBRA questions. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you are. You've got to be compa- uh, passionate about compliance to be a regulatory expert, right? So <laughs> Compassionate or some other things people have told us, <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll stick with compassionate. That works with me. Compassionate, passionate, you know. Yep. Both, probably. Absolutely. I love it. Well, maybe let's just start here. So we're not kidding, uh, uh, audience. We literally have a list of questions that we want to just pepper Bob with. Um, and so we're going to we're gonna kind of go through those questions. So um, we're going to start with, with the, the first question on our list that we've gathered uh, from employers. And it is, can you just break down for us, Bob, you know, a few key points of what, what you think employers need to know about <laughs> ARPA? Let's just keep it maybe broad for that first one. How long is it, this podcast yeah, right? supposed to be? Yeah. <laughs> boil, boil like, down just a few key start with, points. Start with this few. little tiny question. That's okay. All right. <laughs> so, no, actually, I, th- I think there are. There's some pillars that people to have ba- basic understanding, right? And the first one I, is not actually about the rules. It's that we're living on very little guidance. This happens so fast that the, the, the regulatory agencies haven't released much guidance, and we have lots of questions that we really would like answered. And so we're relying a lot on what happened back in 2009. People don't remember that there was a COBRA subsidy back in 2009 that was part of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. And a lot of it was very similar to what we have today, but there are differences. So where there's similarities, we can look back in the guidance of 2009 and assume that we can uh, operate similarly, but there's going to be some differences. So. I guess the kind of the, the the four legs of the stool in my mind are you know only people that had an event that was due to a reduction hours or involuntary termination are eligible for the subsidy. Very important. If you have COBRA because divorce, you got COBRA because you aged out, you don't get the subsidy. It's only those two things that trigger the subsidy. Very important. Um, very uniquely this time, there is this second chance opportunity. We didn't have that back in 2009. If you, someone has had an event back 10, 12, 15, 18 months ago and they didn't take COBRA or they took it and dropped it, they get a second chance to come back and get their free COBRA now. This is new. This is the toughest part of the whole administration, the second chance opportunity. So um, we'll talk more. I'm sure we'll have some questions about that. Um, importantly, there's some notices that your employers or their COBRA administrator need to send out telling people about their rights by the end of this month, by the end of May, in just a few weeks. This is nuts. Um, And then last kind of real important one is people understand that the individuals are not eligible for the subsidy if they're eligible for other group health insurance or Medicare. Not covered doesn't matter. If I'm just eligible where my wife works, I'm not eligible for the subsidy. And that's going to be a really tough one for employers too. Interesting. Yeah. I didn't even realize the, you know, it's just eligible somewhere else because then as for an instance, I would not be eligible for the subsidy because I could get coverage through my husband. So. And how's your employer going to know that? That's a exactly. really tough one. A really yeah. tough one. Another question that we have on our list that I've actually heard quite a few times is, you know, we, there's all these timelines that are really quick. Um, like you mentioned, the end of the month. Um, but employers are still trying to figure out how they're going to be reimbursed by the federal government. So, you know, they're handing out this 100% subsidy. How are they getting reimbursed? 
Luckily, we got we have good information on this one because it's going to work much the same as it did back in 2009. A couple tiny little differences. But basically, you're not going to get paid for some COBRA premiums. You're going to get to take a credit against your payroll tax deposits. So every employer deposits payroll taxes at some time period, depending on how big they are. So if I didn't get $1,000 of COBRA premiums this, mo this month, I just keep that $1,000 out of my next payroll tax deposit. I don't, have to, I don't have to ask for it. And then when I file my quarterly return on my 941, there's gonna be a new 941 with a line where I report what I kept out of my payroll tax deposits. So that's the basic framework. Your payroll departments have dealt with this before. It's very similar to what they dealt with around paid leave for the FFCRA last spring. They could, they could collect those costs through a payroll tax deposit arrangement, very similar. So the process is gonna look just like that. There's some details to work out, but keep your money and then report it on your 941 when you file your payroll taxes. Good stuff, good stuff, I love that. Um, this next question that we've got, it uh, I think you kind of brought it up a little bit, but maybe we'll dive into it a bit deeper, right? So this may be one of, a, one of these who's at fault kind of questions here, mm -hmm. but what if a participant elects coverage what if right, Kelsey but, does that? What, what if she does that when yeah, she knows but, she's not eligible? But, but she, yeah, yeah, but she has access to group health coverage. What? Uh -huh. Who's at fault then? Is that a finger pointing thing? What, what, how does that work? Kelsey, you just broke the law. <laughs> yeah. Because the I statute, tried not to. I didn't know. You the know. statute is very clear. Well, this actually, that's, that's actually true. The statute is very clear. The individual is required to tell the employer if they're eligible for other coverage. And there's a $250 penalty that can be imposed on them if they don't. And you could actually have to pay back the subsidy dollars that you received. Now, that all sounds scary and, and, and great, but this, the, Kelsey, you actually took the words right out of my mouth. These people aren't gonna understand that. Mm. They're not gonna know. People are gonna be electing this, not understanding exactly what. So, mm -hmm. so the penalty's in there. It, theoretically, we can use it as a, a, a incentive to get people to tell us, but it's still gonna be uh, challenging. And it is up to the, based on the law, it's up to the employee or the individual to tell their employer whether they're eligible or not. That's tough. I mean, I even just think about myself and I don't fully understand the law and I work at- and You work Lex. in the business. <laughs> yeah, and you work in the business. So, yes. you know, the average, you know, consumer or participant is gonna be like, well, I was involuntarily terminated. So 100% subsidy, here I come, you know. Remember, these are, these are the people that call us up and ask us what the deductible is on their health plan, right? I mean, you know, <laughs> you look at page one, you know. And, and, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we have a complex, complex business and this just made it even more complex. Yeah, but right. so this next question I think ties nicely into what you just asked. Um, and that's around attestation. I keep hearing attestation. And yeah. I think about if I'm a participant and I'm attesting to the fact that yes, I am COBRA, subsidy eligible my employer maybe is taking my word for it right because yeah. if they don't if they don't know if you're offered coverage by your spouse or whomever mm -hmm. um so what would you say are the rules around attestation and my understanding is it's not required that's right that's um, right no, so what does that look like so you're right the statute doesn't require it and and the department of labor did release some model notices um, but they gave very little guidance. We kind of hoped they would give some more guidance around this whole idea of certification or attestation, and they didn't. But what they did do is when the Department of Labor released their model notices, they released another form that includes a place for the individual to certify that they're eligible, okay? And they suggest that this form should be sent with the notices you have to give people. So without requiring it, they're encouraging or pushing the model that we're using something to have the individuals certify they're eligible. And now that's not just re that's not just important just for the fact that, that, that they're eligible. You got to think about it. When you're an employer, if you let someone ineligible on your health plan, you're running the risk that the carrier is not going to cover the person. So you can't just go willy nilly let anybody take it because that means you're putting ineligible people on there. And when you go try to get your tax credit against your payroll taxes, the IRS is gonna want some documentation. They're not gonna want you just letting anybody have the subsidy and spending federal tax dollars. So this attestation, I think, while not required, is gonna be the norm. I think most employers will use, if not that exact form that the department created, something like that to make employees say, yes, I'm eligible and check the box. Well, let's, well, you talked about the, the subsidy. So, I mean, there's probably people who, who maybe are on the subsidy, but when it, when it runs out, like right mm -hmm. when this is done and mm -hmm. the period's over, 
what are what are the options? Is it can they can they stay on Cobra? Can they go back on Cobra? Are there other options available to to these good, individuals? What's yeah, good step? question. Good question. We just got some news on that the, the Friday. In fact, first of all, yes, they can stay on Cobra if they have more Cobra left. The subsidy doesn't give anybody more than they normally would get, right? If somebody gets eighteen months of Cobra, the subsidy doesn't give them any more than eighteen months. So I often tell people, if somebody had an event seventeen months ago, they might get a subsidy for one month and they're done. So that doesn't change. But when they're, but let's say somebody is only six months into their COBRA and they get the subsidy. When it's done, there's actually a special notice that employers are going to have to send out or their COBRA administrators saying your subsidy is coming to an end. You can keep COBRA if you want, but here's what you got to start paying. Mm. And that would be starting in October. Um, the other option people would have would be to go buy individual health insurance at the end, right? Um, we had some questions about that because the problem with individual health insurance is you're only supposed to buy it during an open enrollment period or if you have a special enrollment opportunity. And the end of the subsidy was not clearly a special enrollment opportunity. Friday, CMS came out with guidance that clarified the end of the federal subsidy, whenever that is, it's supposed to be the end of September now, will create a special enrollment opportunity and people will have 60 days to go back and buy individual health insurance, even though it's not in the open enrollment period. So that option now is formally open to them when this comes to an end. I wanna ask a question based on something you just said. You said it's supposed to end in the end of September. I'm curious, are you a betting man? And if you are a betting man, <laughs> what? Oh. how likely would you say that it's gonna be extended or do You're you think asking it'll end? You're asking me in a recorded podcast to try to predict what <laughs> Congress is going to do. <laughs> you really think I'm that dumb? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I mean, I didn't know, put a wager down, right? So. Yeah. You know, you know I, I, I will say this about it. I mean, it, you know, obviously it's expensive. It's, federal government, it's going to cost the federal government a lot of money. It's a very divided Congress right now. So um, it's going to be hard to pass an extension under this divided Congress unless it's part of a much bigger bill that's that's going through. So I, you know, I I, I honestly can't predict, obviously. But um, uh, if you made me bet, I would suggest that the way things are going with our economy right now, I'd say it's less likely it's going to be extended. If things keep going the way it's going, there's not going to be the pressure this fall to extend it like there would be if things were worse. Sure, there, sure. you made me bad. That's good. I like it. I like it. I'll take it. I, I know that you can't predict the future. I mean, did any of us predict that we were going to have this amount of legislation within right. the last year? I mean, right. I don't right. think so. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll quit with the audibles and go back to the list. <laughs> and right. I don't know that I fully understand this question, but I want to make sure that this HR individual gets their answer. So does the COBRA subsidy apply to the extended COBRA periods um. such as for disability? That is a darn good question. And this is one that we really wish we were get some guidance on. So what this person is asking about is COBRA typically after termination employment is 18 months. So everybody talks about if you had an event in the last 18 months, you're still in your coverage period, you're eligible, right? But there are certain times that COBRA coverage could be extended. If someone's disabled, someone's COBRA coverage after getting fired could be extended from 18 to 29 months. So the million dollar question is, if somebody's in their 25th or 26th month of coverage, but they didn't take COBRA back then, but they're totally disabled and they could have, can they come back now? We think they can, because a literal kind of reading of the law is it just says maximum coverage period. It doesn't say 18 months anywhere. So if we think of someone is still in legally their maximum coverage period, but they don't have it, they need to be given an option to come back. Now, being recorded again, I wanna say this, we're begging for guidance on this one from um, from the regulators because there is nothing in the statute that addresses this one. And so if the regulators come out and say, no, 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 it's only 18 months, we'll all go, thank you very much. But right now, I would say those extended time periods, people would still be eligible as long as the original event was an involuntary termination employment or reduction hours, as long as it was triggered with by one of those events. Well, we're certain those regulators are listening to our podcast, Bob. So <laughs> <laughs> We're certain they're, they're going to hear and give us more uh, detail. I do, I do actually, you know, you talked about involuntary. So there were millions of employees that were furloughed, yes. right? Um, yeah. Unfortunately. And so now what if, what if they refuse, they refuse to go back? Mm -hmm. Is that considered voluntary or involuntary termination? Well, finally, I get to answer one that I know the exact answer because this one was addressed <laughs> this year. Thank you, finally, for giving me one. Um, 
Th this one was addressed exactly in the 2009 IRS guidance, this, this exact example. I, I, it, and they said a furlough is considered an involuntary termination, even though from a legal perspective, furloughs are often treated more like unpaid leave of absence. Um, th they use this example that a furlough unpaid would be treated as an involuntary termination, they'd be subsidy eligible. So that, um, and, and maybe I'll just take this opportunity to say the definition of involuntary termination back in 2009 was extremely broad. People, if it, um, the the IRS, I'm trying to think if I remember the what the number of the the guidance was. If if I find it, I'll I'll tell you. But the the IRS uh, opined on this with se seven or eight questions in a in a release, and they t even talked about someone who, if you moved them from one geography to another and they quit their job because they didn't want to move, that that was to be treated as an involuntary termination of employment because the employer had taken that unilateral action to move the person. I, I use that example because if that's an involuntary termination of employment, then a lot of these other gray areas are clearly should be treated as an involuntary. It's really if somebody marches into your office and says, I quit, I'm just, I'm gone. It's all my choice. That's really the only ones that we're going to say aren't. By the way, I did find it. If you guys want to see that, anybody in the industry, IRS notice 2009-27. That's where the IRS wrote a lot about involuntary terminations back in 2009. So you mentioned the uh, notice in 2009 and how they went more in depth, I believe, on the involuntary terminations. Are you saying that that is how employers should be looking at today's? It's all we've instance? got. Yeah, it's all we've got. So and and the statute this year is written very similarly because in 2009 the, the subsidy was only available to involuntary termination. So since the IRS wrote guidance on us for that part back then, that's all we have to go from now, unless they send out something new that's, that's, that's different, but we have no reason to believe that the involuntary termination employment part would be different now than it was back then. Okay, so another one on involuntary versus voluntary termination. Mm -hmm. Um, this HR individual wants to know what happens if a, a person is terminated, is hired by another company, and terminates from that company as well. <laughs> Sorry. If they're both involuntary terminations, who's responsible <laughs> for the subsidy coverage? That's heavy. So, that's heavy. Yeah. That, that, Did that, we follow that process? <laughs> And, and again, so thanks for giving me one that I knew the answer. Now you're going to give me one. We're going to say there is no clear guidance. So they, th this person did experience an involuntary termination from both. Okay. Um, I think the bet here would be the second involuntary termination would be the one if I was the employee, I would pursue because you think about it, I was involuntarily terminated once and then I went on coverage again. So technically then I was eligible for other coverage, went on other coverage, and I would argue that made me now ineligible for that first COBRA. I'm, I'm speculating, I, I'm just kind of interpreting what I think is best guess, but that that would make me ineligible. And if I were these two employers, I'd say the second employer is more likely on the hook for the COBRA subsidy in that case. I think that makes logical sense, right? But what's logical but, when it comes to all this? <laughs> well, that is, that is a good point. Yeah, good stuff. Well, the, the, one of the questions I think as we kind of wrap up with some of the ones that we've got in here sure. is it's really around guidance, um, specifically when it comes to, you know, what, so the, the question, if I just read it here, is what guidance would you give on what plans to offer when the original plans mm. are no longer available? So yep. That's that's a great question because and we have to look at what the COBRA rules in general say because that happens all the time under general COBRA, right? I quit my job, the employer I quit from has Plan A. Um, six months into my COBRA, they switch and they go with a in different insurance company, goes to Plan B. Under regular COBRA rules, that COBRA continuee just has to move along with the employer to their new plans. Okay, so there's in in this case, if somebody comes back on the subsidy and the plans are completely different than they were seven, ten, twelve months ago when they quit all the employer has to offer is their current plan. So what we're saying is give them the plan that most closely resembles the plan they had when they had their COBRA event, because that's what they would have if they had just been on COBRA the whole time, okay? But one little twist, the IRS gave us rules that we could let people take cheaper plans So for the COBRA subsidy. So maybe I was on plan number two when I was an employee, the employer could say, well, you can have plan number two, but you can also have cheaper plan number one but you can't let them take more expensive plan number three. And think about that because that would cost the federal government more money in subsidy dollars if you did that. 
So our advice to the employer is offer them the most like plan that is the one they had or that and cheaper ones. Yeah, good stuff. I think uh, I appreciate your thoughts there. I know there's <laughs> there's a lot of things that uh, we like to to have our hands and uh, and be able to provide advice, but this is certainly uh, <laughs> your wheelhouse here. This has been good. Maybe the last one I know, which is probably not a, another easy one for you, but are members under uh, eligible? Are members under eligible for ARPA under a state of continuation? Yeah. I don't even know what that means, Bob. Yep. So please help me. <laughs> so okay, well, well, tell, look, well, Kelsey knows what it means. No, I don't. Um, okay. So there, federal law only applies to employers of twenty or more, and it's been around since the nineteen eighties. Um, many states have passed what they often call mini COBRA. Uh, uh, continuation rights for um, maybe employers under 20, or maybe they give more coverage than COBRA gives. So about 30 or 40 states have their own little state continuation that's that's different in COBRA in some ways. And yes, the subsidy will pay for those state continuation opportunities also. So just a simple example, you're in a state that offers mini COBRA to companies under 20. You got somebody that was fired on a company 15, they're only eligible for that state continuation. It may be only six months or eight months or 10 months long, but every state's different. Federal government will pay for that too, if you are eligible for those state continuation rights. Um, good news for employers is the law is pretty clear. The health insurance carriers are responsible for administering and taking care of the COBRA subsidy for those people that are eligible just for state continuation rights. So the employer, but if, if somebody's eligible for COBRA, federal COBRA, the employer's on the hook. That's awesome. I mean, this has been so helpful. I can't imagine, we could do this all day. I mean, we could answer unanswered questions from ARPA all day long. That's, that's but kind of what we do all day long right here. Oh, yeah. we, we, we couldn't even stump you, Bob. I thought we would be able to stump you, but no, you crushed it. I love it. I'm just good at saying, I don't know the answer to that one, but here's what I think it is. <laughs> Well, this was great. And, um, you know, we are coming up on time, but, um, you know, Bob, you've been such a great resource here today for all of those HR individuals. And I just want to call out that Bob is going to answer some additional questions on our blog. Um, so we'll put a link to our blog post in the show notes and we'll be answering additional questions outside of what we talked about today. So go check out that blog post and you'll get maybe some additional que um, questions that you have answered. But Bob, I wanted to give you a second here to talk about benefit comply because I know um, like you said, you've been in this industry for a long time, and I want to hear about you yep. and the team and what you all do. Yeah, thank you. So we're um, real simple. We're a team of analysts and attorneys that just focus on employee benefits compliance rules and laws. And so we support the the administration industry, the uh, health insurance brokers and consultants and employers on ERISA and COBRA and the Affordable Care Act and, of course, ARPA, right? Um, yeah, if you want more information, benefitcomply.com. And we, we, you know, we're here to help people that worry about this kind of stuff. We, we tell people we are the ones that deal with all the stuff you all love to hate. So that's our <laughs> there's always good business in that. No, right, Bob, you've right. been such a fantastic guest. I mean, um, this has been a great episode and I really hope our listeners were able to just, you know, scribble down tons of notes, re-listen to this um, and, and what a cool concept. I'm glad we were able to take some of the questions that we've been getting, turn them around and have you answer them, Bob. Awesome. Right. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Literally 25 minutes flew by. Uh, and Talking I about think Cobra. You, yeah, who would have thought? Right? Would have thought? <laughs> this is fantastic. Well, uh, thank you. It. Yeah, check out the check out Benefit Comply and thank you so much for tuning in, everyone. Wax is in the business of simplifying benefits for everyone. Now, although we certainly hope our podcast sparks some aha moments, like that was pretty cool, but of course we cannot provide legal investment or financial advice. And well, therefore, nothing shared in this podcast should be interpreted as such. We encourage you to seek out appropriate professional advice regarding your plans. Hey, congratulations. You made it through our disclaimer. <laughs> Thanks for listening.